Greetings to you all. Uh, Salam alaikum and welcome. My name is Michael Spath. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and uh, a member of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of four webinars designed for congregational use, digging more deeply into our recent 2021 United Church of Christ General Synod Resolution passed overwhelmingly with 85% of the vote, Declaration for a Just Peace between Palestine and Israel. It's a landmark resolution among Christian denominations in its designation of Israel's occupation of Palestinians as sin, the topic of this first webinar. And webinar two, Israel's laws and legal procedures as an apartheid system. We'll also be discussing webinar three, the need for a political solution based on a human rights-based approach, and webinar four, the pervasiveness of Christian Zionism, not only among evangelical churches, but in mainline churches and in American civil religion. Finally, it's important to note that the United Church of Christ and the Declaration for a Just Peace uh, draws on over 30 years, over 50 years, over 50 years of general synod resolutions. It's informed by the witness uh, uh, of national and global ecumenical partners and especially responds to the witness of our Palestinian Christian partners. In particular, the 2009 Kairos Palestine, a word of faith, hope, and love from the heart of Palestinian suffering, and the 2020 Kairos Palestine, cry for hope, a call for decisive action. Today's webinar is entitled, Israel's Oppression of Palestinians is a Sin, with our distinguished panelists, uh, Yusuf al Khori, lecturer in biblical studies at Bethlehem Bible College, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and the Academic Alliance for Interfaith Dialogue in Palestine. Reverend Catherine Cunningham, member of Global Kairos for Justice, past moderator and current member of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the pa Presbyterian Church USA, and um, a co-author with Nusheen Framke of the recently released F Focus Palestine. And Reverend John Thomas, retired general minister and president, Ut United Church of Christ, and member of the steering committee of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. Welcome to you all. Let's get right into it. I'll come to each one of you in turn. John, I'd like for you to start by telling us why it's so important that this is the Declaration's first resolved, quote, the continued oppression of the Palestinian people remains a matter of theological urgency and represents a sin in violation of the message of the biblical prophets and the gospel. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, it was very clear to us as we began to draft this resolution that we wanted to build explicitly on Cry for Hope. Uh, Cry for Hope speaks about sin in relationship to how Christians view uh, the oppression of Palestinian people uh, and the situation in Palestine and Israel, uh, and it is very clear that it, uh, it understands silence in the face of this oppression or active support of that oppression as a sin, a violation of the gospel. So we wanted to build on that uh, and speak specifically about how not only within the Christian context is it a sin to support this, but the oppression itself is a sin. Uh, this moves beyond where we've been in previous General Synod statements and very clearly makes this a theological document. Therefore, the, the declaration is framed as affirmation and rejection, uh, very much in the tradition of the Barman Declaration in Germany in the 1930s and the Belhar Confession in the 1980s in South Africa. 
Thank you, John. Yusuf, uh, the Palestinian Christian communities cry for hope, said, quote, the very being of the church, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the credibility of the gospel is at stake. We declare that support for the oppression of the Palestinian people is a sin. Tell us more. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's definitely, you know, um, the integrity of the Christian, the integrity of the church at a stake when it comes to supporting or being silent uh, when the Israeli oppression against Palestinians continues since 1948 uh, and is still going every single day in Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza and even in 1948 against Palestinians. The call of hope came out as the Israeli authorities decided to pass the laws that discriminate against Palestinians who lived in the 1948 lands and um, decided on annexing parts of the West Bank, which makes the calls for, for peace and the work for peace impossible. The issue that comes that many churches around the globe and Christians support those kinds of moves against Palestinians, which makes the Christian faith the proclamation of the good news that the church claims to carry from uh, Jesus Christ and the first church is actually a threat because how come that the good news become bad news to Palestinians? Thank you, Yusuf. And Catherine, uh, in your new book for the World Communion of Reformed Churches, Focus Palestine, which you co-authored, as I said, with Nusheen Framke, part three is entitled systems of sin and the Jerusalem microcosm. Tell us what you mean by that. Thank you. In addition to the Barman Declaration and the Belhar Confession, with which John just identified, um, the World Communion of Reformed Churches has its own confession called the Accra Confession. And out of that confession, which is a 20th century confession um, as well, is the uh, notion that any form collectively of oppression, that's economic, political, human rights, ecological, constitutes a collective understanding of sin. And so when the, the World Communion of Reformed Churches asked us to put together a handbook on Palestine, we began with that collective understanding of sin and proceeded as we looked at at various forms of oppression that Palestinians endure, the ones that Yusuf just pointed to in his response, we saw that there are systemic forms of oppression which Palestinians endure daily and have for 70, over 70 years. And so picking up the language that's part of the reform tradition at Accra, we applied that to the, the categories that we listed out there. And I can tell you that in editing, we eliminated um, as many uh, other options for systems of sin as we included. So that is not comprehensive, that, that is suggestive. But we wanted to focus on apartheid and uh, persecution as understood under international law and see the rest of that as part of that systemic oppression. Thank you, Catherine. You know, um, normally, uh, and, and this comes, th this raises some of the, uh, uh, addresses some of the criticisms that we've heard about the declaration uh, from critics from within the church. Normally, you know, when people think of sin, we begin to list personal transgressions, matters of individual conscience. Yet, uh, Catherine, you pointed out, and I'd like Yusuf and John to maybe respond to Catherine's comments. Uh, there's theological language that we use to describe social and political and economic and legal structures of oppression. So I want, I want you, to, John and, and Yusuf, to pick up on Catherine's comments about this use of sin language. We have the personal, but there's also the systemic. And apply that then to the Palestine-Israel context. One of the biblical texts that we quote in the background to our resolution is from Isaiah 
uh, the collection of woe statements. And one of those statements is, woe to those who add house to house and field to field until there is no own room left in the land and it is empty of people. I think, I think that really speaks to the, the settler uh, problem in, in, in Palestine, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, uh, where and in Sheikh Jarrah, where we see that happening even today. It really reminds us that these structures of settlements uh, in violation of international law also go to the very heart of our understanding of justice in the scriptures, in the prophetic tradition. Uh, and so uh, it's not simply that one individual makes a decision or acts uh, in a sinful way, but the whole structure of settlement expansion of occupation uh, really violates what Isaiah describes as, as a fundamental injustice in, in his prophetic work. Thank you, John. And Yusuf? Uh, I can't agree more with uh, Brother John. Um, I also add into that that the passivity of the church uh, in addressing the option of Palestinians as sin is sin. Um, I think being um, silent and not speaking up for the people who cannot speak for themselves, for the people who've been shut down for a uh, case is a sin itself. Uh, the Bible encourages um, us as people who believe in, in the book and in, in the Bible that we should speak up for those people. We should be advocates for those who are oppressed, who those who can speak uh, cannot speak for themselves. That's why our word as a um, cry for not only um, a calling for uh, statements, but a, it's a call for action, right? It's not only calling for a prophetic word, but also for a prophetic action. The church has to move from a place of just praying and speaking up to a place where it takes a stand, a clear stand against this sin. Um, and I see this collection against Palestinians breaking every law of the Bible. You know, uh, the land has been stolen from Palestinians. Palestinians are being killed every single day. The, the vineyard, the uh, olive grove Palestinians are envied by the settlers and the Israeli government. Those are uh, important things of the that has been bro broken every single day. Not only that, you know, the Israeli uh, oppressive system, the empire, has been dehumanizing Palestinians, and in that it strips away, it takes away from the Pal from Palestinians the same image of God that they were created in. We all created in God's image, and by being dehumanized and demonized by the Israelis. We are denied the very fact, the very right that God has given us all. Thank you, Yusuf. You know, I, I read the first uh, res the first resolution earlier. The first rejection in the declaration says the following: We reject the notion that Israel's occupation of Palestine is a purely political problem outside the current concern of the church or that the oppression of the Palestinian people is an inevitable consequence of global or regional geopolitical interests. So let's just address this head on to people in our church or in other churches who criticize the UCC and other denominations for mixing politics with theology. Let's, let's address it head on. How do the three of you address that criticism? John, why don't you go first, and okay. then Catherine, and then Yusuf. Well, theology is inherently political. Uh, theology, our understanding of theology, uh, drives our uh, political perspective. Uh, certainly, that was the case in South Africa, where uh, the church, uh, not the whole church, but the 
predominantly white church, uh, used its theology to set up this system of apartheid. And that's directly what Belhar confronted, um, the Belhar Confession. Uh, one can't be uh, politically neutral uh, as a theologian. And so the Palestinian cry for hope is a political document because it is a cry for political resistance, not just spiritual resistance. Uh, and the United Church of Christ uh, has a long standing tradition of engaging in political action, uh, not simply not trying to be a state church, for example, uh, but attempting to say, here is how the gospel impinges on people's lives in the political system. Catherine? One of the things that I point out to people when I am delivering a speech or doing a, a class on Palestine is that Jesus himself um, came into the world under a system of oppression and occupation. And so his words, which always take us to the lived lives of the people of that land, and most especially not the rulers, but the folks who are pushed to the margin, tell us that there is no gospel without looking at human forms of socialization and community. And so it is critical that theological language not be divorced from the lived lives of Palestinians. In fact, and, and this is something else that I point out to them, we have the church because of the enduring presence of the Palestinians in that land and of their efforts to hold on to the words of the gospel that Jesus gave us. Empire is built in to the world that the gospels address. And it is incumbent upon us all as Christians to understand what John just said is that the theological is always the political. And therefore, systems of sin never are simply the actions of individuals, though it is that. It is the action of all forms of uh, social, political, economic, and ecological oppressions and, and harm. And, and, and the Palestinians, all of them, face those every single day. And so we must be about tearing down empire as it affects the lives and the future of Palestinians in their homelands. Yusuf? I'm so, uh, reminded of how Jesus came to Palestine proclaiming the coming, the King of God. And it just let it sink in. God, Jesus was proclaiming the coming of a kingdom where he is a king in a position to the Roman emperor who was the king of the land. Jesus proclaimed the good news that he's making a revolution against the oppressive system of the Roman Empire who oppressed the Palestinian Jews who lived in Palestine and other people of other faiths. So I don't see theology and politics divorced. I see God at the heart of politics. What God wants to do in politics is to redeem it from the corruption uh, that the uh, global empire, the, the sinful nature of, of human beings had uh, built into it. And I see the church and the Bible, the proclamation of the gospel is purely a political and theological uh, statement against those corrupted systems and calling people to live, you know, the good life. God came to bring life and uh, abundant life. And what else other than that is a sin against man? So taking away the, the, the very uh, right of the Palestinians to live, um, with integrity to live abundant life is been taken away by a political system. And if the Bible doesn't speak against that, then what the Bible is. You know, uh, uh, 
I'm, I often think of the, the two pronged role of the church. There's the, the sacramental pointing to uh, indeed embodying the presence of the kingdom of God, the spirit of God in, in all things. But there's also the prophetic. And that's really what we're talking about today here. Uh, the prophetic, an extension of the first commandment, brokenness, the, the idolatry of, of institutions and ideologies. And very much present in our day, how privilege has blinded and still blinds us. So talk about the role of the prophetic in the UCC's declaration. And uh, Yusuf, and then Catherine, and then John. Uh, first of all, I applaud the UCC for taking such uh, powerful steps um, and being prophetic in words. And I know that you've been uh, long a prophetic also in action to bring Palestinians and um, having people from the United Church of Christ and, and, and Palestine supporting the local community. And uh, I hope and wish that the UCC will also adopt uh, Christ in its totality and taking uh, further courageous steps of uh, maybe uh, being clearly against the, the Israeli occupation of all its forms and doing their best and their investments and uh, other things to stop the Israeli oppression and the Israeli occupation. Um, in every way, uh, you know, when the UCC makes a decision, I think it also encourages other denominations to follow. So uh, I hope that's what happen in the future. People in other denominations would be encouraged to the same steps as the UCC. Thank you, Yusuf. Catherine, maybe say a word, uh, not only about the role of the prophetic in the declaration, but the role of the prophetic in the resolutions that you've been a part of in the Presbyterian Church that can maybe be uh, uh, offer us insights in this conversation. One of the, I do want to say something about the UCC statement and it's, it's grounding in Cry for Hope um, because that relates then to the the, the answer to the question about the Absolutely. Um, at the very end of Cry for Hope, uh, there is the affirmation that uh, anything that threatens the humanity and all of creation um, can be found, in fact, in what the Palestinians are experiencing. But the last sentence is goes to the prophetic comment you made, Michael. In making this confession, we embrace our membership in the community of broken bread, the church fulfilling its mission to bring good news of God's gift of love, mercy, compassion, and abundant life for all. Um, one of the things that um, the Presbyterian Church has shared with all of the churches globally that have addressed this is to root um, its statements and its policies, and I, I admit freely that we have fallen short even of our best intentions and highest words, but that taking an action in actions in face of the continuing criticism and in fact threats of abandonment and violence um, and various kinds of repercussion is what being prophetic is about. And, and that those are statements or actions, whether it's divestment from American corporations or calling for boycotts of uh, wood of goods from illegal settlements um, or uh, protesting the uh, the continuing exclusion of uh, Palestinians from uh, religious freedom and the opportunity to worship in in their holy sites. Any of those, and those are statements we've taken as Presbyterians. Um, all of those uh, come from the notion that God's intention for God's world is for justice. And uh, I loved the uh, UCC use of Isaiah and, and thought as well uh, as 
about the suffering servant language, especially in Isaiah 42, where it's clear that the servant's role is to bring justice to all of the nations. And, and I would point out that it's always, the prophetic has always been collective. And again, it is out of this land that we call holy, that the suffering servant songs are addressed to the world. And we have a responsibility to the continuing residents of that land, all of them, to be lifting up that biblical call to justice for all. Thank you, Catherine. John, uh, in your response to the role of the prophetic, um, maybe take an extra second or two just to talk about uh, some of the other resolutions that uh, uh, have passed the UCC general synods to that, that highlight the work of the prophetic and the United Church of Christ. Uh, the, uh, the, this, this declaration was deliberately <laughs> to serve as what we call the plumb line, uh, a way to, to kind of measure our UCC response uh, moving forward. Uh, are we in line with, with this declaration? And of course, the term plumb line is from Amos also uh, sets a plumb line uh, for Israel. Uh, it also was deliberately provocative in many ways. We wanted to use provocative language, sin, apartheid, um, boycott, divestment, sanctions, uh, right of return. These are, these, are, uh, these are terms and phrases long used, but, um, but provocative in many settings. And we wanted to put them there. And I think that's part of the prophetic task. Uh, but this resolution builds on, on a whole history of resolutions in the, at the General Synod of the United Church of Christ uh, around uh, dismantling the wall, uh, ending the occupation in 2005, calling for the use of economic leverage um, in 2015, and explicit support for boycotts, divestments, and sanctions uh, in uh, 2017, a, a deliberate uh, call to end the practice of the military detention of children and so forth. So it really builds on, on a history and a, and a whole uh, series of resolutions. I want to I want to speak also to your comment about sacraments and the sacramental nature of the church. When sacraments are prophetic acts, uh, we we tend to sentimentalize them. Uh, a cute little baby, a nice gathering around a table with our friends. Uh, but can we really baptize a baby with water and not think about the Jordan River and its placement now in the midst of this conflict and oppression? Can we baptize a baby with water and not think about uh, lead in the water and flint? Can we gather around the table and not see it as a rehearsal of what Yusuf reminded us is Jesus' essential message, the coming kingdom of God, this new empire, a very different empire than the one Catherine described uh, that Jesus was incarnated in. So the sacraments themselves ought to be seen as prophetic, ought to be practiced as prophetic acts, and made very specific in terms of the political realities of the day. John, I want to follow up with you and then ask the other two to respond. Uh, you know, mainline churches aren't usually noted for emphasizing discussions of sin. <laughs> uh, uh, yet yet a, a robust Protestant theology of sin also includes an equally robust theology of grace. And uh, in fact, theologically speaking, the reason we can admit the, that we can see that we can honestly confront the destructiveness of the political, social, and legal systems of oppression, as well as within the human heart, is because of a preceding and even greater, more powerful reality of grace. And so how might we apply such a theology of grace within Palestine and Israel? Uh, Ron was famously uh, said that uh, original sin is the only uh, verifiable, empirically verifiable doctrine of the church. <laughs> uh, the, uh, 
But the theology of grace, here's where Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, is helpful to us. Uh, he reminds us that grace must never be cheap. Grace must never be easy. Grace must, must come in a call to radical discipleship. Uh, grace is not a, a whitewash of the evils and the oppressions in our, in our communities, in our world. Uh, grace is not a way to evade or escape from the realities of sin and our own complicity in that. Grace, rather, is a reminder uh, that through our baptism, we can transcend those structures, we can transcend those realities, and we can commit ourselves uh, to radical resistance to them. Uh, so grace uh, is freeing and liberating, but it's always freeing us for something, liberating us for radical discipleship. It is never to be seen as cheap grace. Yusuf and then Catherine. Yes, uh, what a wonderful reminder, Brother John, uh, that's been over. Um, I believe that the grace is, is a manifestation of God's love that seeks to liberate us all. And here I want to quote from um, our call of hope, that our call is rooted in the logic of love that seeks to liberate both the oppressors and the oppressed in order to create a new society for all the people of the land. And I believe that grace is the gateway to do so. The grace that uh, built, uh, that manifested in the logic of love is the gateway that for, for all of us, the people who live in Palestine, uh, to create a new society based on justice, peace, and uh, genuine reconciliation. Thank you, Catherine. In Galatians, we are reminded that for freedom's sake, we have been set free by grace and not to submit again to a yoke of slavery. While that passage is often individualized, it is actually the understanding that grace is collective as well as the individual experience of the remission from and the call sin and the call to live in newness of life. One of the things um, that becomes very important as we consider grace is that the outcome collectively of the experience of being set free is that we are then called to costly solidarity. And costly solidarity is the manifestation of the willingness to live the truth of grace that John and Yusuf has pointed, have pointed us to, that it will cost us something, not because we're paying something back, but because in, in the face of the world, to stand on the side of God's grace found in Jesus Christ, and to be standing with all of those who experience the, the oppression, the harm, the marginalization, the poverty, means that we will be asked to accompany in a costly way. If I could just add one more thing. I think, I don't want to speak for the authors of A Cry for Hope, but the very title of that statement is a manifestation of grace. In the midst of oppression, in the midst of intolerable circumstances, it's not a cry for vengeance. It's not a cry of despair, it's a cry for hope. And I think that in itself is a reminder of the centrality of grace, both in the struggle, uh, but also as the means by which the struggle continues. Let's get concrete then. Um, what, what are some of the political, social, legal, religious manifestations or signs today of both sin, Catherine, you talked about some of them earlier when you talked about systems of oppression, but so the political, social, religious, legal signs of sin, but also of grace in Palestine and Israel uh, today, and maybe even here in the United States and around the world. Catherine, you wanna start, then Yusuf and then John. Okay. Uh the manifestations of sin 
are found in the way that human rights and humanitarian law are consistently violated. Whether that is restriction of movement, whether it is uh, the continuing um, occupation itself, which has long since stopped being occupation and which is why both Beth Selim and, and Human Rights Watch and now the uh, UN Rapporteur Michael Link's report all call the situation apartheid. But there are other ways um, daily, the um, continuing threats of displacement, dislocation, not to mention people grabbed in the night and arrested uh, and sent to military prisons for who knows how long are all manifestations of sin. The grace I see and the most important lesson in some ways that, that my Palestinian siblings have taught me over the years is the grace of resilience and resistance, which comes um, from within the Palestinian Christian community in that uh, labor of love and, and the idea that the logic of love leads one not to condemn the oppressor, but to call the oppressor to the life that has been abandoned in the oppression. And so the logic of love is the manifestation of grace I see among Palestinians. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I would also add, um, Catherine, um, Two days ago, Gilad Aran, the ambassador of uh, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, tore down to pieces the human rights report, which documents the violations uh, uh, that Israel committed against Palestinians in, uh, in May and uh, up to the last few uh, months and weeks. I just kind of act of uh, of arrogance uh, demonstrated by the state of Israel is an act of sin. And God hates the most is arrogance. You know, so, um, and that's what keeps bringing up in, in David's Psalms uh, and the Old Testament. For me, the arrogance that the Israel uh, government and the Israeli state has been um, prideful of even arrogant prideful of that arrogance is a sin but the grace in all of that that searching hand for peace um, I, you know Palestinians never never uh, I remember in in I the Palestinian declined any peace initiative uh, with the Israel Thank you, Yusuf. John? I think one manifestation of sin is the, the willingness of the United States government for decades uh, to essentially disregard aspirations, the legitimate rights, the human rights, the international legal rights of Palestinian people. Uh, and we have been willing to do that uh, under the the notion that somehow this is in our interest uh, and that uh, we have a special responsibility uh, to Israel uh, as, quote, the only democracy in the Middle East, uh, that somehow this will be a bulwark against uh, enemies that we have described as uh, part of an axis of evil and so forth. So that readiness to disregard, to dismiss, uh, to marginalize, I think, is a collective act of sin, and uh, it's manifested both in the willingness of the American public to allow itself to be complicit in this, as well as the readiness of many Christians um, to ground that support in a distorted uh, interpretation of scripture and in a distorted understanding of the gospel. So, those are manifestations of sin here, I think, and many of us are caught up in that. Uh, grace is what's trying to free us uh, from this. Uh, grace is what is allowing many in the United States, I think, to, to some new awareness, some new recognition of nuance, uh, 
We see it in some media reporting. We see it in some uh, political movement. Uh, these are concrete signs, I think, of grace that is moving us toward a deeper recognition of the realities of sin and the need for liberation from that. One of the questions that's come through the chat room, uh, how would a Jewish Israeli react to this declarations uh, uh, calling uh, Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people sin? And let me add just another question to that. A uh, number of us uh, have Jewish partners. I know there's no monolithic, we understand that right together. There's no monolithic Jewish uh, uh, community when it comes to its understanding of Israel and Palestine. But talk to us about uh, uh, our conversations with Jewish friends here in the United States uh, with this declaration in our hand. And maybe uh, Catherine and John, you can address that more clear, um, more experientially. I want to begin with where you started your question, and and that is is that it's important to understand that within Israel there are multiple perspectives about the occupation, the settler colonialism, and the erasure that the Palestinians have endured. And the same is, is true here in the United States. On the one hand, it's important that the church continue to acknowledge its role in both anti-Semitic and, and, and thank you Will, in Islamophobic uh, forms of theology and behavior. At the same time, it's important to know that many Jews in the United States understand that criticism of the policies of the state of Israel and of the Zionist basis for those policies does not constitute anti-Semitism. And so it's important as the church continues this discussion with, with the various Jewish communities within our country and certainly globally, that we be very clear about uh, what criticism of a nation state, including our own, means uh, politically and socially, and be able to distinguish that from the, the criticism often uh, given against the churches globally, that you are being anti-Semitic if you criticize Israel. Um. I think it's, uh, it's helpful to understand that there are multiple dimensions of engagement and relationship with uh, the Jewish community. Uh, when I was general minister and president, that tended to happen at official institutional levels with groups like the Anti-Defamation League, American Jewish Committee. Uh, and they naturally have an institutional responsibility to be staunch defenders of Israel. Uh, and those dialogue processes tend to be extremely difficult, uh, extremely confrontational and contentious. And we saw that played out after our resolution with uh, a very harsh uh, statement from the American Jewish Committee almost immediately. Uh, so that's one level of relationship that uh, needs to continue, but I don't see a great deal of promise and possibility there. Uh, but there's another level of local and regional engagement where there are longstanding relationships um, and where difficult conversations can take place uh, and where difficult conversations need not lead to harsh public exchanges of, of denunciation. Um, in fact, uh, the Palestine Israel Network is right now working on collecting a, a set of uh, resources that will help people in those local communities. People, people naturally are uncomfortable when they feel that they are being designated as a sinner. Uh, what we're really talking about are structures of sin, as Catherine has reminded us several times, and uh, that we're all complicit in those. And, you know, we see a parallel with that here. As we try to confront the realities of racism in this country, we're more and more aware that this is a structural problem with great historical 
uh, uh, import that has contemporary resonance. Um, and bringing that forward in terms of redlining, in terms of wealth uh, stealing, in terms of all kinds of, you know, of, of poor public schools, we could go on and on. Uh, there's a whole now movement to, to attack that. Uh, I'm not a sin, I'm not a racist. Uh, you know, politicians would say, we're not wanting to teach our kids that they're racist. There's a total disconnect with this more uh, realistic understanding of, of the structural nature of this. So it, you know, constantly reminding people that we're not labeling an individual Jew in Haifa or Tel Aviv, you're a sinner but that the policies of your government in which you are somehow complicit are sinful and need to be addressed. I wanna shift gears quickly. Thank you all. I wanna shift gears. Uh, the, the proper role of the church uh, is its theological analysis of the political issue. And I'm particularly impressed, I'm particularly impressed with the declaration uh, as much with the theologies that it rejects as much as what it affirms. And I'm going to read two, and I'd like Yusuf, you to begin, and then Catherine, and then John. We reject any theology or ideology, including Christian Zionism, supersessionism, anti-Semitism, or anti-Islam bias, that would privilege or exclude any one nation, race, culture, or religion within God's universal economy of grace. Second, we reject the use of scripture to claim a divine right to the land as the rationale for Israel's illegal seizure and annexation of Palestinian land. So Yusuf, please respond. I don't see you, so he's he's here, but he's uh he's muted. Can let's, you unmute him, Michael? Yeah, let's let's find him and unmute him. Somehow he keeps bouncing off, and then yeah, he's at the bottom of the participant list. Yeah, I see him. Yes, uh, um, thank you, Michael. Uh, my internet has been unstable. Um, I think. Those kinds of rejections and the statement are powerful. Um, I, I agree totally that there is no divine right to the land for uh, any group of people, for Palestinians alone or for uh, Muslims alone, Christian alone or, or Jews. Uh, the land is a gift from God that we can keep and maintain, that we can enjoy together if we live peacefully and justly. Uh, what, what actually is my concern that when, whenever the issue of the Israeli oppression is being uh, mentioned, the Palestinians or whatever organization do that has to defend itself against anti-Semitism, you know? Uh, that worries me that all, every time the Palestinians and anti-Semitism seems to be at the same line, which is not. You know, the issue and the struggle of Palestinians, you know, is in itself a sin. And we don't have to keep rejecting every other sin around the globe to justify our rejection of the sin against Palestinians. Uh, so... Of course, I agree, and, um, and that we need to have an emphasis that every human being is created in God's image and, and uh, deserves respect and being treated with dignity and uh, with love, including the Palestinians. And unfortunately, that every time as a Palestinian, when I talk about that, I need to set aside a, a word like including Palestinians because we have been excluded every time we have been suppressed uh, by the claims of or, or being um, you know uh, accused of anti-semitism superstitionism and and all of that thank you yusuf catherine at the heart 
of the reform tradition is the affirmation that God is God and God as love, God as the initiator of grace, mercy, and wholeness is the one who determines what the economy of grace looks like. And so Christian Zionism, supersessionism, actually any theology that attempts to delimit and to control for whom grace has abundantly been given is uh, not just sin, it's heresy. And we need to be plain about that. Along with that is, is the understanding that the biblical Israel and the modern state of Israel are not identical. And that any attempt of using the Bible from whatever tradition that claims that they are the same or that the modern state of Israel is the fulfillment of the understanding in scripture of the land is heresy as well. It's also important to understand and, and the Palestinians um, and you said maybe you can speak to this. The Palestinian theologians are very clear when they talk about the fulfillment of the understanding of land being found in Jesus and in his saving work. And it's very important as we educate in the church that we carefully use scripture, carefully use notions of covenant, carefully use notions of redemption and salvation in a responsible way and not to align them with any particular theology and certainly with not any particular political system. Yusuf, do you wanna respond quickly and then we'll turn to John. <laughs> the Christian, the Palestinian Christian theology sees Jesus at the heart of the message of the Bible as whole. Everything in the Old Testament for out Jesus and we can we can read from Galatians, we can read from uh, Ephesians, from Romans, that the true uh, offspring of Abraham is Jesus. Uh, Paul clearly talks about it's not about offspring, but offspring. It's a singular pointing out to Jesus, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Um, Paul, in, in, uh, in his uh, epistle to uh, Colossians, the Church of Colossae, he writes clearly that Jesus is the yes, he's the only, he's the complete uh, fulfillment of all the promises were given to Israel, uh, to Abraham, and the children of Jacob. So every time we read the Bible, we read it through the lenses of that event in history that Jesus fulfilled those promises and we live and we continue to live on those promises. Thank you. John? Uh, any theology that um, supports the dispossession of one people, their birth rate, uh, is, uh, is idolatrous, is heresy. Uh, one of the hopes, uh, I think, from our declaration is that uh, and we introduce the term settler colonialism uh, into our resolution, uh, is that we'll begin to see connections between what's happened to the Palestinian community at the hands of Israel and its greatest patron, the United States. We'll begin to see the connection with what happened to indigenous people here in the, in the United States through the doctrine of discovery through manifest destiny it was a theologically driven understanding that the land was our birthright and we could dispossess uh, the indigenous community. And it led to genocide. And in Canada, here in Australia, we're becoming more and more aware of the realities uh, of that sin, that collective sin. Uh, you know, the, the theology of the Third Reich was a theology that supported uh, the dispossession of the Jewish people uh, and ultimately uh, supported their collective deaths. Uh, the theology of Christian Zionism is a theology which supports the dispossession of the inhabitants of the land uh, by uh, Israel. Um, 
ironically, it's no friend to Jews, uh, uh, but it conveniently uh, is, uh, is uh, that's overlooked by Israeli politicians who are more than willing to take support from Christian Zionism. But uh, if you look carefully at that theology, uh, at the end of the day, literally, uh, uh, it's not a friendly theology toward toward Jews. Uh, but we need to we need to understand that uh, the dispossession of the land by settlers of any sort uh, throughout history uh, has ultimately led to to genocide and ultimately led to an abandonment of the Christian gospel. You know, John, you you provide a, a perfect segue to my next question. Um, we know that Kairos Palestine, uh, the 2009 Kairos Palestine document was written in conversation with South African theologians and their Cairo South Africa document from 1985. And that's referenced, right? Apartheid in South Africa is referenced in the declaration. Also the Jim Crow conditions in the United States South between reconstruction and the civil rights movement. That's uh, referenced in the declaration. You just referenced, John, the dispossession of the indigenous peoples uh, in, in the United States. Uh, so I wanna ask the intersectional question that might be helpful for us. What uh, have we learned, what, what can we learn about Palestine and Israel, that context from these examples and others? Uh, Yusuf and then Catherine and then John. Uh, can you just uh, um, give me more on your question? Clarify sure. Uh, what can we learn from uh, uh, the situation of apartheid in South Africa, the Jim Crow conditions in the United States that led to the civil rights movement, among others, uh, the dispossession of Native Americans, the indigenous populations here, You've, you've kind of, you all have referred to it uh, throughout the conversation, but I wanted to uh, uh, make it very clear for our listeners uh, uh, in your responses to the question here. This intersectional kind of understanding of uh, uh, the dispossession of native peoples. You know, the, the example that you just- and, Excuse me, you show and, us. And, and these racist understandings as well, please. Yes, the questions that uh, the the examples that you have provided actually are very important because it shows us that the trend of oppression continues throughout the history and manifests almost in the same way as dispossessing land, oppressing people, uh, dehumanizing, demonizing the native and the indigenous people of the land. Uh, it shows that the, the structural and uh, institutional systematic oppression. Is always uh, is o has been always been here, and unfortunately, we haven't learned anything from that history. Unfortunately, it took the world about seventy years to describe the Israeli occupation as an apartheid, which is the same as what happened in South Africa. Um, however, it's about twenty years since the uh, South African. Uh, liberation, let's say, uh, from that system of oppression. And the world still insists on making the same issue with Palestinians, neglecting the Palestinian uh, right to live freely, neglecting the Palestinian uh, liberation. And I believe as people around the globe who suffer of that oppression, we have so much to learn from each other. Uh, I remember when uh, George Floyd uh, was uh, killed in the United States, uh, people in Palestine went out on the streets and uh, on the wall, there is a huge paint of, of George Floyd. That person now for Palestinian is like a, a symbol of resistance of uh, the people who are um, being assassinated by oppressive system or killed by oppressive system. And I hope that people who watch, people learn that history, that they will also see through the Palestinian eyes. 
uh, whatever and for uh, how long the operator system lasts, there will be point of turning. There will be a point that um, the Palestinians will be liberated, will be free. And I hope that we will work together today, learning from those, uh, those uh, lessons of history now to make it happen as soon as possible to help. Thank you, Yusuf. Catherine? The system by which human beings are dehumanized, made into commodities, and forced to endure the uh, prerogatives of those who would seek to take their lands, the, um, the resources of those lands, and in fact, in the shameful history of slavery, particularly in Euro Christianity, of turning humans into property and into uh, a form of economic uh, structure building that may be among the worst uh, examples of what we human beings do to one another. Those are all present in certain ways uh, in what has happened to Palestine. And so the settler colonialist project, which is in fact what Zionism is about historically, as well as the er erasure of culture, of language, of traditions, and even of cuisine in Palestine is, is another way of rendering, attempting to render Palestinians as absent and as, as um, lacking in humanity and richness uh, and is, is part of the continuing sin uh, that ethnic cleansing is. <clears throat> John? I think the, um, the South African experience is, is somewhat instructive to, to the, uh, our other, the other issues you raised. There was an attempt through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to, uh, to move beyond apartheid. Um, and it was a significant uh, attempt uh, to name the truth. Uh, but it's clear that truth without repentance was not very meaningful. And repentance without reparations of some sort uh, ultimately falls short. So I think the South African experience speaks both to, to the United States, it speaks to Israel, uh, that there must be a confrontation with the truth, truth about uh, the history of slavery in this country, truth about the genocide of the indigenous community in this country, uh, the truth of the dispossession uh, and degrading and uh, elimination of visibility of the Palestinian community. That, that truth needs to be confronted, but there needs to be repentance as well. The reconciliation won't happen without repentance, uh, which means a significant turning, not just an intellectual reckon, reckoning, but a, uh, a whole um, communal uh, repentance. And then as we're seeing starting here in this country in small bits and pieces, the conversation about reparations, uh, what is owed? In our, in our uh, declaration, uh, we lift up the right of return. That has to be woven into some understanding of reparations, I think, ultimately uh, in the Palestinian-Israeli context. Uh, it's going to be a very difficult conversation as it's been very difficult in South Africa, as it's been very difficult in Zimbabwe. Um, but how do, we, how do we move from naming the truth to engaging in acts of repentance to actually involving ourselves in reparations. I think that is that ties together multiple experiences around the globe. You know, John, I'm so glad you brought up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. That was my that was my last question or my second to last question. And uh, I was going to ask ask you all to uh, make the connection with the Palestinian context. So thank you for that. Uh, let, let me let me uh, wrap up uh, our conversation by asking you this. Um, Catherine, I'm going to come to you first, then John, and then Yusuf. I'm not sure most Christians in the United States or even around the world realize the urgency, the, the, the urgency 
of the call from our Palestinian friends. Uh, even before the cry for hope, right? We had Kairos Palestine uh, document in 2009, 2017, a coalition of Palestinian Christian organizations wrote, things are beyond urgent. We're on the verge of a catastrophic collapse. This is no time for shallow diplomacy, Christians. So say a word about the urgency of the moment that this declaration addresses. One of the difficulties in the church, and in fact, in broader um, cultures, particularly in the cultures we call the West, is that the teaching we've had about the formation of the state of Israel coming out of the atrocities of the Second World War, along with the pervasive political uh, perspectives of our respective countries, has meant in effect, the silencing of Palestinian voices and therefore um, making even more urgent, more critical, but also more difficult, um, the centering of their voices and the, the uh, solidarity accompaniment that the church is called to be about. It means that even more urgently, we need to be working at the local level in our congregations and in our various um, uh, denominational governing boards and bodies, uh, the discussion about Palestine, because Palestine, and, and this goes to, uh, to the last, very last section of uh, Focus Palestine, Jerusalem itself is a microcosm of the world. I am heartened by the fact that when the expulsions uh, were announced in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, along with a follow-up of the obstruction of uh, worship uh, for Orthodox Easter in May, and then the bombing of Gaza, a crack in that lack of awareness has happened. And it's up to the church now, I think, to take advantage of that crack and open it wider and shed light on the truth of what has been happening over these 70 plus years to Palestinians and to be about um, seeking justice through engagement with governments as well as other civil society and interreligious um, actions in our institutions. Thank you, Catherine. John? I'm uh, picking up from what Catherine said. Certainly, the uh, the bombing of Gaza opened up a crack. Uh, that was a, a way for many Americans, I think, to recognize a, a, an urgency. Uh, but you know, things fade, and should we really be looking for death and destruction in Gaza to help us become aware of the urgency? Uh, it's a reminder, I think. Uh, that uh, the imp impressive resilience of the Palestinian people and the, uh, the nonviolent resistance uh, that has been very much the norm, uh, although not always recognized here, uh, that that may not last forever. Uh, and that, uh, that Israel and the United States essentially offer Palestinians a choice between silence and submission on the one hand or violence on the other. Um, so the urgency is this uh, keeping open a third path uh, that Cry for Hope reminds us of, offers us, uh, challenges us to take up. Uh, that's, the, that's the urgency for us is making sure that we help maintain the third path of, of nonviolent resistance, which offers a way toward truth telling, but also offers us the way of grace. Yusuf uh, referenced that earlier in the cry for hope, uh, he, the, it's quote, the logic of love that seeks to liberate both the oppressor and oppressed in order to create a new society for all people of the land. Thank you, John. Yusuf? And let me conclude with a factor from a person who's in the ground. Uh, 
on in all the states as we talk about being on the fringe of collapsing uh unfortunately we are collapsing uh, we are not on the fringe we are not on the edge we are already collapsing as people now as society in palestine there is no hope for peace um the vice president uh the president uh, uh, prime minister of Israel, uh, bennett made it very clear uh, a few days ago that he's not working to have Palestinian state. For him, Palestinian state is not possible. So talking about peace is talking about uh, illusion. Um, uh, that's the reality of it. And if we don't stand clearly and firmly against the Israeli uh, arrogance, against the Israeli oppression, there is no place for peace. Israel will continue to annex the land, will continue to take away from us every single uh, uh, candle that we try to light along the way in, in our walk for peace. Um, for me, as a Palestinian who uh, teach young adults in, at a school in both the Bible country and uh, Dar al Kalima, I can see this struggle every single day. Um, I see the distrust of my young people, uh, our young people as Palestinians, of the um, political negotiations or even disengagement between Palestinian government and the, Palestinian, the Israeli government. So we are not on the fringe of collapsing. We are collapsing. Uh, there is no way to wait. There is no uh, place and time uh, for us to try to um, to find maybe uh, a new resolution and, and like uh, for two states or one state. There should be a firm and a clear stand against oppression and with the oppressed that will push both sides to, to come into a peace agreement that's everlasting and would guarantee a genuine reconciliation between the people. Of Palestine. And I think as a church, we have the responsibility for that. Paul calls us the ambassadors of peace, the ambassadors of reconciliation. And if we are not taking seriously that mission, then who should be doing that? So I encourage the UCC, I encourage all the Christians who would watch this or who are here to be ambassadors of peace. And being ambassadors of peace means to stand also for justice where there is, uh, like Jeremiah, you know, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And that's the reality of Palestine, which part of Palestine in 2009 adopted this uh, verse from, uh, from Jeremiah. It's 12 years later, and it's the same situation and even getting worse. Uh, the uh, Israeli aggression in, uh, in May this year um, the marking of Palestinians housed by Israeli settlers, the destruction uh, that Gaza endured in that war is beyond imagination. I have family in Gaza, which tells me that all the streets, the, the streets that connect uh, neighborhoods were completely destroyed by Israeli uh, F-16 machines. So, Please, uh, I, I encourage you now to, to feel with us that there is no more time to wait as what we experience on a daily basis. And in, in these days, actually, the Israelis are cutting uh, power supplies on Palestinians for four hours a day. So you can imagine what more we are um, having ahead of us. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, I'm going to let each one of the panelists uh, share a closing word. So Catherine, uh, your closing thoughts for the day. And please make a commercial for uh, Focus Palestine as I see in the chat room, okay? So include, include that in your closing thoughts for us. That actually was going to be my closing thought. <laughs> uh, the World Council of Churches uh, took a, an action in 2017, it's called Action 55, to pull together resources that would be available to the entire global church, addressing the urgency, the sin, and the continuing oppression of the Palestinian people. 
Um, their new publication, Focus Palestine, can be found at wcrc.ch. If you put in a search engine, Focus Palestine, it will take you to the handbook. It is a free download, um, three, four parts actually, including the appendices and, and 13 videos. So that's my commercial for um, the new publication, which to, for an organization to which the United Church of Christ um, belongs and is an important member. My final word is that we learn what sin is by engaging in discerning what our behaviors, what our country's policies, what, um, what the experiences, the lived experiences as, as we are told about them are. And there's no question that when it comes to the experience of Palestinians, they have been living with a pervasive experience and harm of sin. And so it really belongs to the church, and this is my final word, to be about the continuing discernment and as, as John pointed us to, the truth telling, the facts on the ground, the repentance, and to be about the work of restorative justice, which is in fact the call of the gospel. Thank you, Catherine. Yusuf, please. Yes, um, I can see that the process initiated uh, by the UCC um, about taking a clear stance on Palestine um, and addressing the oppression as an occupation as sin. Uh, today, I encourage you just to engage in a study about the Palestinian situation and the Palestinian, uh, not only in, in books, but even, you know, meetings with Palestinians uh, now virtually, but when you come to Palestine, come and see the Palestinian people, the Palestinian a living a church, the people, uh, the Christians of of Palestine. And just to repeat what I said earlier, uh, we are called to be um, a, a prophetic, a, a prophet, uh, to be prophetic in our words and action against the sin of occupation, and also using the logic of love, um, which confronts the systematic uh, oppressive system with their sin. Actually, that's a grace when you when we uh, confront those systems with sin, with their sin. It's a kind of offering them a pathway to grace. And uh, I encourage all of us just to keep working as ambassadors of peace and reconciliation uh, for this world. The world needs us. Uh, the world um, and Palestinians and Israelis alike are hoping and longing for peace and justice, uh, for a, a prosperous life. Thank you, Yusuf. And John, your closing thoughts. In some ways, the, the greatest danger we face is despair. Uh, again, I remind you that this, this resolution was really inspired by uh, the voices of Palestinian Christians in a cry for hope. The statement of faith of the United Church of Christ includes this phrase, in Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, God has come to us, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. That's the foundation and that's the basis of our hope. And so as we do this work, as we respond to Yusuf's cry of urgency, as we learn uh, from Catherine's long years of experience, uh, as we look around the, the Zoom gallery at uh, colleagues and friends, uh, let us remain steadfast in our Christian faith, which is the grounding of our hope and is the most important antidote to the despair, which always threatens to overwhelm. Well, I... Uh... Uh, I want to say thank you on behalf of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. Uh, 